Can you hear me okay? It's 30 seconds, okay. <laughs> Welcome everybody, I'll make sure that that didn't break and then we'll get started. <clears throat> Awesome, there's a few seats, but uh, I guess the stairs are gonna be there. Make yourself comfortable. So welcome everybody to Underactuated Robotics. Uh, my goal for today is to have you leave here understanding what underactuated means. Thank you for coming to a course if you didn't actually understand the, the name of the class yet because it's, it's a fairly obscure name, I understand. Which I hope to convince you by the end of the hour that it's maybe the right word for it's the, the best single word I could find to describe the type of robotics we want to talk about today. The mic's a little loud, is it, in the room? Or is it okay? It's okay? All right. All right, so um, what is underactuated robotics? And why should you study robotics? Why should you be here? Why should you take the class? I like to say why study dynamics? Because I actually think it's um, more broad than just robotics. We're talking about general approaches to controlling and reasoning about nonlinear dynamical systems. So why should you do underactuated robotics? Well, can your robot do this? Where is it? There, this, right? This is basically my favorite robot video of all time. 
Uh, it's so, so good. I'm sure many of you have seen it, but if you haven't, it's just the fact that that's real is just amazing. Okay, so I mean that's a pretty new, uh, pretty new thing. Robots couldn't do that a few years ago. A lot of the reasons that we can do that today is well, it due in a large part to the hardware getting much, much, much better than we've ever had before. And actually, that's a trend that we've seen over the last few years. I, I've watched over the last 15 years. There's been sort of a sustained investment um, across the, the world, but across um, in the U.S., funded a lot by the DARPA, uh, DARPA and the DoD. There was sort of this lasting, consistent investment in robotics hardware that somehow around, I don't know, 2010 or something like that, it's like, whoa, that all just paid off. And suddenly, it's not just Boston Dynamics. Like, everybody suddenly seems to be able to make a quadruped that looks amazing or a biped that walks. It's like, how did that suddenly happen all at the same time that everybody, it was kind of like the four minute mile. Suddenly Boston Dynamics did it and then now everybody's got a quadruped that looks almost as good, right? Um, but we've seen, there's Cassie by Agility Robotics. Toyota's got this amazing humanoid. Spot by Boston Dynamics, is, it's about to be a product. There's like a sales link on their website now, right? You can go and say like, ask how much does it cost? Animal by Antibiotics looks really good. There's a bunch of robots that look a lot like Spot now. Somehow, um, the world has changed. We have amazing hardware, okay? Um, <clears throat> And, and more than that, it's, it's, we're in this crazy time where, th where these robots are about to completely change the way we live, right? Why would you not want to be a part of that? And, and we've see, we're seeing it happen. I mean, I, a few years ago, we basically watched it happen with UAVs and, and drones, right? So a few years ago, there were drones only in the research labs. They started getting out into industry. Suddenly, I actually just bought a Skydio R2. It's pretty cool. Uh, chasing my kid around the, the yard. Um, until the city figures out its drone regulation policy and then I have to shut it down. Uh, but, but suddenly you can like buy a drone that has capabilities that we could only have in the research lab just a few years ago. I'd say autonomous driving is sort of happening now, right? I mean, it's, it's, you could argue about how long it's gonna take or whatever, but, but that's the one that's happening sort of today. I'd say, and this is just right around the corner. It's, uh, you know, what is this gonna do to our world? I don't know, but this is the, you guys are in like the best possible position, the best possible time to help us figure this out. Okay, but despite the amazing hardware, the problems are far from solved. Um, I'm gonna show you something completely amazing here, okay? Oh, not, oh shoot, I went out of order. I will show you in a few minutes something completely amazing, um, right? But first, let me tell you a little bit how I sort of set the backdrop by how I got here, because um, I, I got to MIT in the year 2000, which when I wrote that down and thought about how old many of you are, I, I kind of shook my head this morning, but, I, but it's true, I've been here about 20 years. Um, when I showed up, the, the, uh, the AI lab was mostly in NE43, it was part of over, over in Kendall Square, it didn't, we didn't have Status Center yet. And down in the basement, the dungeon of the NE43, was this mysterious famous lab called the MIT Leg Laboratory. And in the MIT Leg Laboratory, there were robots hanging from the ceiling that had been built by Mark Rabert in the 1980s. And there was this you know, vibrant lab of people working on walking robots. And, and the robot that was walking you know, the days that I was you know, applying to MIT as a grad student and, and was walking when I went to visit the, the Leg Lab, uh, one of them was this Trudy, which was one of the first robots that could walk around of this size, built with hobby servos and the like. But boy, was it so cool to go down to a place where they were working on stuff like this. Okay. Um, I was in the lab. I tried to, I was working with a computational neuroscience um, professor for my PhD, but I was in, hanging out in the leg lab as much as I could. And I was there the day that Honda visited the leg lab and sort of showed this video. And this was, um, this was around the year 2000, but they, had, they built it over the course of, they started sort of like in secret around 1980. They worked on it sort of in secret for uh, 15 odd, 20 odd years. And then in 1997, they first started being a little public about it, 98. This is P2, okay? And I remember being in the leg lab when they showed this video and people were like, 
you know, what just happened? Um, you know, this is incredible. They're showing it walking around, walking upstairs, pushing a cart. This was just like hugely influential. Honda just surprised everybody with what they could do. And I would say this was the, the real birth of real humanoid robotics getting mainstream. Okay, but there's still something unsatisfying about that, right? And we're gonna talk about why do robots walking around like this all the time, right? And it's not just aesthetics that are bad. It, it actually, you're burning, I mean, that gets tiring. You're gonna burn a lot of energy on your, your, your knee actuator's heating up that whole time and you're walking around like this. So we'll figure, we'll talk a little bit about why. But around the same time, there was a much less sophisticated, but I'd say as important result happening. Um, we were talk I was learning about this concept of passive dynamic walkers, okay? So this is a similar, you could almost not even call it a robot. This is a, a bunch of sticks and hinges and um, put together with curved feet, put on a small ramp and they give it a little push. There are no motors, no batteries, no controller, and it's just falling down the ramp, okay? And most people would say, that looks better than ASIMO, or better, better than the Honda robots of the day, P2. Looks more natural, looks like someone taking a stroll in the park, right? It's certainly using more energy. Its entire energy source is the small, very low, so you can see how small the ramp angle is. It's at a very low angle and it's getting a little bit of energy from gravity, but it's powered basically purely by gravity, okay? And it looks better in some sense. It's not pushing carts, it's not going upstairs, that sort of, doesn't work, um, but there's something very right about what they're doing here. And it captures, I think, in a deep way, what isn't happening in the Honda approach, and, uh, the more, and maybe a more common approach. And actually that dichotomy, that's still there. The limitations of what we can and can't do, they're still there. They're still there in the Boston Dynamics videos and other places that you watch. You just have to have a more discerning eye to see that the big difference between the Honda's approach and the passive dynamic walkers Honda is using high gain feedback and lots of energy in order to try to sort of replace the dynamics of their robot with something that we understand well. Maybe it's linear, maybe it's easier to solve, okay? Um, and that works well when you have a lot of energy, to, to, a lot of power to give, a lot of control authority, but it breaks down when you have to try to do things that are more dynamics, more at the limits of your performance, if you're trying to be more efficient, or if you just don't have enough actuators, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about what that means, okay? Um, but similarly, the Leg Lab has always sort of taken this very dynamic approach. So Mark Rabert's um, Leg Laboratory back in the 80s, actually, while, while some robots were trying to walk very, very slowly like this, he started building robots that were throwing themselves through the airs. This is clearly a actuated robot, but it captures a lot of the same ideas of, you're doing a little bit of control to add energy into the system, make it hop around, but you're also relinquishing a lot of control to the world. To, you're letting physics do a lot of the work, okay? And he built this amazing series of robots from one leg to two leg. This one for, had the world speed record for bipeds, and bipedal robots for a little while. Um, it's been eclipsed now. And these robots um, ultimately turned into Boston Dynamics robots. In fact, I was in the leg lab the day that I was just sitting there writing some code next to one of the grad students and Mark Rabert shows up and he looks at this treadmill which was in the corner up against the wall. He's like, is anybody using that treadmill? We're gonna start building robots at Boston Dynamics again and I wondered if we could get that back, right? And that was sort of the birth of, of a, an incredible new legacy. But even back then they were doing backflips, right? This was the first quadruped. Okay, and Big Dog and the series and now Spot. Some people would argue that a lot of their control system is, is still built on these basic principles that were designed with simpler robots back then. And here's the evolution of Asimo. Incredible how that happened. Right? This is also, I mean, this is sort of mind blowing that they can do this now. And a lot of it really is the hardware. I don't, but I think there's a, there's a big part of it still that there's a software problem. How do you do this more robustly? Even these robots, things can go very wrong very fast if 
their ability to cancel the dynamics has, has somehow uh, been compromised. If they got the model wrong, I don't have the heart to show you some of the videos of the robots falling down, but you've probably seen them. If you're not, it's easy to find on YouTube of robots that thought they were in, touching something and then falling over, um, right? So there's things that we just still don't know how to do with robots. So my first goal for the class is to tell you what I can about how robots like this work, okay? But my real goal is to inspire you to, to try to solve the next wave of problems. I think now I have an amazing video. Well, let me see if I get it right this time. All right, so ready? This is an amazing video, right? I have no idea how people do this, right? I, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about a lot of algorithms, a lot of math, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, robot ideas. I could not tell you how to program a robot to do this task, right? It's mind-blowing, right? Um, humans are so good and we're so far from being able to do this with a robot. And it's not just because we don't have dexterous hands. It's, it's I don't know how to even write down the control problem that's, that this person is solving. Okay. Not surprisingly, I believe one of the fundamental reasons why we can't do that is because it's an underactuated control problem, okay? Um, so let's try to get in a little bit um, into, into sort of what is underactuated. Okay, here's some definitions. We're gonna be thinking a lot in the class about differential equations. So, so the, the prerequisites from the class, I'm actually trying to get them to remove the robotics as a prerequisite for the class, the, the other robotics classes on campus. It's awesome if you have them, but I actually don't think robotics is a real prerequisite for the class. We are gonna do a lot of differential equations, and we are gonna do linear algebra, and we are gonna use Python, but those are the only real prerequisites for the class. Um, but we are gonna write a lot of differential equations and my part of my goal today is actually to show you a little bit what that's gonna look like so you can, you know, go study if you need to or, or slow me down or speed me up or whatever and get some, some feedback, okay? So um, we're gonna be thinking a lot about nonlinear differential equations. The general form of that is I'll write them in a state space form where x is the is a vector of state variables. This is a vector of control inputs. And this is the time derivative of the state, okay? Um, <clears throat> we're gonna focus mostly in this class on mechanical systems, which means, although this is a first order because it's only got the first derivative flying around, we're actually gonna think a lot about second order equations, so equations that are basically F equals MA, right? So for, for mechanical systems, We have second order equations, and I will use characteristically Q to be the position variables. Like joint angles, for instance. Q dot is the velocities. And then I'll, we'll be thinking about second order equations that have this form. This is just a second order differential equation. Okay, in fact, almost all of the, so the, the name of the game, one of the names of the games here is, is gonna be 
um, anytime there's structure in these equations f that we can understand or exploit, we're gonna try to do that as much as we possibly can. So it turns out if you get second order equations out of the basic Newton's laws, then you're going to have even more structure than this. Um, in most cases, the systems we'll think about actually are control affine. So I could even write it more specifically like this. Okay. All right, so this is just a more specific way to write this when it's possible to write it like this. It's calling out the fact that u enters in a simple way into the equation. The dependence on q and q dot can be arbitrary, but the dependence on u is simple. It's, a, it's not linear because there's a constant term, so it's affine, okay? Um, <clears throat> all right, now we have the, the stuff to d give a definition of underactuated. So, well, I'll start by saying what's fully actuated. So we now have our um, linear algebra test. If I give you a position and velocity which describes the current state of your robot and you evaluate the dynamics in that state, actually it's sufficient to just evaluate F2. And you ask, a, that's gonna be a matrix, right? So this is a vector of, of length n, for instance. I could say this is, uh, um, it lives in Rn and the U lives in Rm, then F2 is N by M matrix, right? This is an N by M matrix. So then you, I'm asking you to check the rank of that matrix, and if the system is uh, the, the matrix is full row rank, so the rank is at least n, only, can only be n, then, uh, then I'm gonna say the system is fully actuated, okay? Since it can't be more than full row rank, um, we're gonna say it's under actuated in Q, Q dot if the rank of F2, Q dot, is less than N. To be careful here, because these equations are in general um, state dependent, I've said that the property of a, of a system being underactuated is a state dependent property. You can have systems that are underactuated in some states, not underactuated in other states, but typically we do not. Typically it is true that your system is either underactuated always or it's fully underactuated always, and in those cases we'll just use the, the simpler form saying underactuated if it's for all Q and Q dot, okay? So why is this such a big deal? Why does this, in my mind, separate the interesting control problems, the interesting robots from the uninteresting robots, okay? My claim is that if F2 is full row rank, then control is easy and deserves no further attention. Well, that's not quite fair, but, but uh, that's another class. Um, it's really when F2 is not full row rank that things get fundamentally harder. And I'll try to convince you here. So why is that the case? 
there's an idea out there called feedback linearization or feedback cancellation. Can people see that or is that too high? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Actually, we'll also ask you to do that for the for the problem set. But um, uh, let me let me actually wait on that a little bit. We're going to have some good examples, I promise. I, I first want to get a little bit further into even the simplest version of what's underactuated in, in that. <clears throat> okay, so if I'm given my second order difference equation. But by the way, thank you for the question. Ask lots of questions. I, I'm sorry that I didn't answer that particular one, but uh, I love that you asked it. I'm going to also assume that I know with F1 and F2 are known, which can be a big assumption, right? Do you actually know the equations of your robot and the environment it's operating in? That can be a big, tall order. But in the case where we do understand the dynamics, we have a good model of our robot's dynamics, then um, consider the following choice of control law. So I'm going to say this is some desired acceleration that you get to specify, commanded acceleration, okay? Um, what does it mean, what would it mean for me to type this in? I've got some algorithm, some software running on my robot that has to measure, has to look at Q and Q dot instantaneously, compute this function of Q and Q dot, F2, take its inverse, F1, it takes its reference command, the acceleration here, and then by, from that it, it computes a U, which it then sends to the actuators, right? So this is just, I'm allowed to write, some, anything I can sort of write in code here is fair game, yes? Nope. Um, nope, it shouldn't be, I think. Because what happens is if I take this equation now and I think about what is the resulting controller in the system, then I can just substitute this equation into here. There should be? Okay, yeah, you're, sorry, good call. Yes, I would have gotten there. So, good, yes, thank you. That does cancel this, right? And the result is the entire system is reduced to this system. Okay, when am I allowed to do this controller? Well, I'm allowed to do it when the inverse of this exists in, all, in, in Q and Q dot. What is the condition that suggests that that matrix has an inverse? It's that it needs to be full row rank, okay? So precisely this controller works if your system is fully actuated and it doesn't work if it's under actuated. Okay, so what does this mean? This means, another way to say this is I've taken my original system, I took my Honda robot or whatever it is, if I'm able to write down this equation, this set of equations and implement it, then I've canceled out the dynamics of the system and replaced them with a much simpler dynamics, which is just sort of the trivial second order linear system. Right? So this is to say, this is, if it's possible to do this, then I, I say that the system is feedback equivalent. I was able to write a feedback controller to show that I can make it equivalent to the system Q double dot equals U. If I think of this as a different control input, this might as well have just been the simplest linear con control problem we know how to solve and we know a lot about how to solve it. So in some sense, yes, please. Would it be possible to write slightly larger 
I can certainly write larger, yes. Um, if there's anything that's not legible yet, I can rewrite, but otherwise I'll, I'll write larger from here on out. So, um, right, this is a big deal. This is the idea that I've taken some interesting system, it has lots of dynamics, okay, and I've used potentially a lot of control. The numbers that come out of this inverse, for instance, might be very big. Right? It might be that it takes a lot of torque to effectively, if I, if I have my leg that wants to swing forward like that passive dynamic walker, but I instead impose you know, this, right? I'm actually doing a lot of work, not only to hold myself up with my bent knee, that's already inefficient, but there's actually momentum in my leg that I'm actively canceling it with torque in order to slow it down just so the system stays under my simple, sort of to make it look like a simpler model, okay? So this idea of feedback cancellation is very powerful. It's, there's places where you should use it in the real world. I, I like to joke that you should feel bad if you do, but that's, I don't, that's not real. But um, um, this is a very powerful concept, but it relies on the system being fully actuated. What's surprising is how much of our robotics control pipeline is dependent on that assumption. Underactuated, means that you can't make that assumption. And it's, again, it's surprising how much, how many of our favorite tools just sort of fall away. So underactuated is this, the single best word I found to capture the idea that you don't get to do this, you don't get to replace the dynamics of the world with whatever dynamics you wish. You actually have to think about the dynamics of the world, reason about it, relinquish some control, let physics do some of the work, you can still do amazing things, right? Animals do amazing things. Tying a shoelace is amazing. But you can't do it by replacing the dynamics of the shoelace with your, uh, uh, you don't have enough fingers to do that. Um, I want to, there's, there's another name for this control, so of this type of control. This is one example of a feedback linear, linearizing control. Okay, where it took a nonlinear system and turned it into an equivalent linear system. But I just want to be careful, for those of you that know the term feedback linearization here. That's a very closely related, but just slightly different idea than under actuation. It's also, um, a, nice, a useful thing to distinguish the, 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 whether a system is feedback linearizable is similarly interesting in terms of finding a class of systems, but it's slightly different than the definition of underactuated. So you can see that because I could write a linear system that is clearly feedback linearizable, but that doesn't have, you know, this could be a, a, a scalar matrix. You can have a linear system that is underactuated, which is clearly feedback linearizable. Okay, and so they're just slightly different ideas. We're trying to be careful about that in the notes. Um, there's also a, typically an assumption that, the, that you can convert a nonlinear system into, a, to, to call something feedback linearizable, you'd like to convert it into a controllable linear system, but we're gonna talk, we're gonna talk about the implications of that later. Okay, so it's related to uh, feedback linearization, it's not quite the same. It's also related to non-holonomic constraints in the first order cases, not quite the same. Under actuation is sort of the second order constraints. The first, it's on the, on the second derivative, whereas a holonomic constraint is on the first derivative, or on the path, yeah? Okay. Um, there are other things that can, um, so, so my slightly more general definition of, of under actuated is if I don't assume this feedback form, I just go back to the general form of a second order nonlinear equation. I'd like to say the property I want here, right, even if it doesn't have a, a, as simple of a decomposition, I'd like that for every u, for, for every desired q double dot, I can find some u, right? That there's a map that I can, I can produce arbitrary accelerations. From any state, I can make command an arbitrary acceleration. Okay. 
Now there are things besides this matrix losing rank that can hurt that. So other things we'll, we'll see, we'll talk about if you have input limits, right? If your actuators, if, if your actuators saturate, at some point I can't produce arbitrary torque from my physical actuator, then that similarly can break this ability to do feedback cancellation and become, force you to think about the long-term consequences. Uh, you can have state constraints You can also have model uncertainty. I'm trying to remind myself about the size. You probably see every fourth one is about is a little bit bigger and then. There are other things that complicate controls in similar ways, okay? They're all related to this idea that you, if you don't get to cancel out your dynamics and put in some arbitrary, simple linear dynamics, then you have to do a lot more and think about the long-term consequences of your control action. I think that's like the most beautiful form of control and I'll try to communicate that. Like a dream for me would be, um, I've got a piece of paper that's falling through the air with complicated fluid dynamics, right? But somehow, what if I could just, and make it land exactly where I wanted to, right? Physics is doing almost everything, but I just wanna give it a kiss of control effort and have it do exactly my will. That's the dream, that's like the, you know, and, and the fact that I don't know how to do that is sort of why our robots are still a little janky, honestly. So, uh, you know, I think there's a, the next wave of really impressive results in robots, maybe uh, it, you have to solve some of these really hard problems. Is that clear? Do we have a sense of what underactuated means in that sense, the algebraic sense, yes? Controllability is a slightly different definition. So we'll give examples of systems that are controllable, but they're underactuated. Yeah. They're cl closely related, but actually um, you can still get to arbitrary states. It's like for instance, a linearization of, a, of some of our canonical systems, you can still get to the origin, okay? But you have to take a circuitous path there because of your underactuation constraints. It's controllable, that's, it's by all classical definitions of controllability, it's, it is controllable. And we'll see that in, in, um, in some detail when that comes up. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're also, I told you we're gonna do a little bit of differential equations with, you know, in matrix differential equations. That's your first taste of that. Um, we're also gonna work with robot equations. So, um, but you don't need to know how to derive robot equations. Never in this class am I gonna assume you really know robot kinematics or dynamics. We have software that can cough those equations up for you these days. Um, but you should f be familiar with the form of them so that you can exploit that form. Okay, so let's think a little bit about how do we get F for a robot. This will be the only time I ever derive it, um, but I want you to see it once and see where it comes from. Okay, so. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of the simple examples and the, I think the helpful examples for thinking about these kind of problems result in, you know, they're, they're basically a, a couple of, of linked pendula. Simple, ser simple serial manipulators or, you know, just swinging pendula, right? In fact, Atlas doing a backflip is actually very well ac represented by a handful of just rigid links connected with torque sources at the joints, okay? That's one of the things that's amazing that they've done is basically made that abstraction true with incredible engineering and 3D printed titanium valves and the legs and all these other things that made it so that when I command a torque, I get that torque at the joint. And uh, they do have things bending and rippling and stuff that are not, it's not actually completely rigid, but uh, it's, it's like way closer to that than we have ever been before. Okay, 
So let me think about the simplest forms of that are, are like a one link pendulum. I'll do the two link pendulum now because it's not that much harder. Okay, so I'm going to say that there's, in the simplest form, I'm going to just have two point masses, M1 and M2. So I don't have any mass on the rod, it's just a, a, a fictitious link here, okay? Uh, <clears throat> it's of length L1, got theta 1 here, theta 2 here, representing the joint angles, L2, gravity's pointing down. Okay, so how do you generate the equations of motion for this? The standard tool is to work with the Lagrangian equations of motion. Many of you know this very well, some of you haven't seen it. Again, we have a software that will generate these for you almost always, but the consequences of it being derived from a Lagrangian mean that those, there's even more structure in those equations, F1 and F2, take a very particular form, and we're gonna do our best to exploit that form to try to find it. Optimization algorithms that are more convex or, you know, or structured feedback controllers or ways to predict farther into the future because of it, okay? So the way you get to the Lagrangian is you first write down the, the kinematics, which I can do by just saying what is this, if I say this is the location, Cartesian XY coordinates of M1, I can just do some basic linear algebra. Sorry, trigonometry, which I tend to shorthand, okay? That's just shorthand for sine and cosine because if you have done Lagrangian dynamics, you know that it doesn't take many links before the, page, the math takes a whole page, right? Uh, that writing it, writing it down gets big fast, okay? Similarly, I can cascade this and I can say P2 is P1 plus the coordinates of the next link, L2, you end up getting a sine theta one plus theta two. Okay, which we can, sim we can write out I write the kinematic, the kinetic energy which I can write as in, in my matrix equation form. It's, of course, it's one half mv squared, but in matrix form, that is just p1 dot transpose m1 p1 dot. That's just one half mv squared, but in, in vector form. write down my potential energy. And then I put T and U into my Lagrangian, which I have notes on. And it comes out with a handful of equations, which in this case look like this, and they're in the notes, so you don't have to write all that down. I don't, nor do I. <clears throat> Okay, but when you turn the crank on the Lagrangian um, approach to deriving the equations of motion, you're gonna get, in this case, you have two position variables, two velocities, so that's two degrees of freedom, four states. In those two degrees of freedom, right, I get, a, a, I get equations that look like this, and there's, there's two of them, right, the second order equations, there's two of them, but actually they're not quite in this form yet, right? But they're close. If you do this for rigid body systems like this, where the input is a torque around here, so this would be tau two, this would be tau one, if I say that Q 
is theta one, theta two. And similarly, Q dot, theta one dot, theta two dot. And I say U is tau one, tau two. Then I have everything I need to write down that sort of equation. And this recipe, which you can run for any rigid body system like this, you just write down its kinetic energy, its potential energy, you take some derivatives, you get a series of equations. They're always gonna come out in a form that sort of looks like that, okay? And with a lot of thinking, it turns out it's not, it's not, there's, it's not an accident. There's, there are reasons underlying it. But there's a general form that these equations all, that have more structure than this, that these equations always have when you turn them through the Lagrangian, okay? And those, that, gen, that more general form is called the manipulator equations, okay? You see a pattern from doing this over and over again, and that pattern looks like this. You get a, you should map, as I write this, you should map it to that set of equations there to make sure you see. Okay, so this thing is the mass matrix or inertial matrix. This captures the Coriolis terms, okay? This captures all the gravity terms. This is my control inputs and this is a map from control inputs to joint coordinates. It looks a little arbitrary. Why do I pick some things to land on this side of the equation and some that I land on this side of the equation? But basically this is MA and this is the sum of my forces. There's forces due to gravity, there's forces due to my control input. If I had damping or other forces, I would all put all, I put all my Fs here. This is MA equals a sum of forces. The Coriolis terms and the mass terms are, they, they go to, they're really the same thing. That's just a artifact. I change coordinates, uh, those things change together. So those, those are really the same thing. Okay, so this is, a, this, this is gonna be our favorite set of equations to start from when we talk about robots in the class. It's true for a double pendulum that looks like this. It's true for Atlas doing a backflip, okay? Uh, if you start doing fluid dynamics, it gets more complicated, but, but even, even for systems with some fluid dynamics, we can get pretty far with equations like this. And it turns out these equations, you can already see that they're more structured than this. It's, it's saying some specific things about, for instance, Q dot. There's always a dependence on Q dot that I can write out. Okay, there's more things we know. We know, for instance, that the kinetic energy of the system, I could always write in terms of the mass matrix. And this maybe is a, informal justification that the mass matrix can't be negative, definite, and somehow that kinetic energy is always greater than zero. So for, we know, for instance, that the mass matrix is always positive definite. We know things about, we know other properties of these, these equations, which we'll explore as the need for them arises. But just, I want you to be excited about those equations. That's a, it seems like the right level of of detail in the sense that um, you know we get a lot of benefit from writing that specific structure, but also the right level of generality that most of the robots we think about actually are described by those equations. So it's somehow in the middle of the modeling hierarchy <clears throat> and works well. So um, if I wanted to write it in that form, of course, because this mass matrix is positive definite, I, could have, I can write Q2 double dot is MQ inverse 
times the rest of those equations. I'm allowed to do that because we know the mass matrix is positive definite, okay? And now you can see that I was telling the truth. A lot of these systems that we care about are in fact, U enters in an affine way. U enters simply, even though, even after you've done M inverse whatever, so F2, right? Is just M inverse Q BQ. I can, I can write it in that original promised form. So what does that mean? If I want to check the underactuated condition, the, whether the system is fully actuated or underactuated, what do I need to check in these equations? Yeah. Let's say it again. Even simpler? Yeah. Well, so I've given you that M is already positive definite. So, so it's sufficient for B to be full row rank, right? So if B is full row rank, implies fully actuated. And similarly, if it's drops rank, it's underactuated. Okay, so what size is B? What are the dimensions of B? It's got to have N rows, if I say N is the number of degrees of freedom in my robot, and M actuators, if M is the number of actuators. So a simple condition to check for underactuated, if M, the number of actuators, is less than N, the number of degrees of freedom, then you're underactuated already, right? So if you just go through and count the equations of motion, you look in your equations of motion, count the number of degrees of freedom on my robot, count the number of actuators. If you don't have enough actuators, you're underactuated. Now this is where I have a friend, Manoli Kellis, who he likes to tease me, he says, uh, so if you had more research funding, would you do fully actuated robots? Uh, no. Uh, so uh, this isn't like a, it's not like uh, I overlooked that step um, or, or didn't spend enough in our research funding, right? Some robots are fundamentally underactuated. So take Atlas doing a backflip. We're gonna think a little bit more about that. How many degrees of freedom does Atlas have? Well, it has 36, okay, and we end up having 73 state variables, though you can think about why that would be. But 36 degrees of freedom on Atlas, but it's only got 32 actuators. Did they just, I mean, they 3D print titanium. They clearly would have put another actuator on if they could have, right? So you gotta think about, and we're gonna ask you in your problem set, uh, you know, why, what's the gap there? What, what happened there? Why is there only 32 actuators but 36 degrees of freedom, okay? Um, <clears throat> But let's just, just think a little bit about, about you know, what this means, right? So first of all, if I take these equations, we're gonna give you software for the course that hopefully makes it easy to play with these kind of things. Um, it's, it's an experiment, but we're gonna try to do it in CoLab. So you don't need to install anything, at least until maybe for final projects or something, you'll wanna have more power than Colab can provide. But Google's Jupyter Online Jupyter Notebook services, we're gonna see how far we get with that and ask you regularly for your feedback on whether that was a good decision. Okay, so um, I, I wrote a little robot, universal robot description format file that describes that I have a link here with a mass here and a link here with a mass here. You can look at that afterwards, everything's here. And I basically said, load that robot and simulate it, okay? And off it goes, you can just simulate the equations of motion that you get out of, a, out of the standard of Lagrangian very easily these days, okay? 
That's our double pendulum. Cool thing is you can, you know, it's, you can do lots of things. Oh, that's nice. You can plot all your variables and everything. It's just a standard, right, interface for, for thinking about robot dynamics. There are some other cool things you can do. You can, of course, um, you can load your, your double pendulum and you can ask, give me this M, C, tau, G, B form. Right? You can ask for the um, manipulator equations form of the dynamics, okay? And you see if you run that, you get M, C, and G, and B all at a particular state. So if I, if I called Q dot, sometimes in our code we'll call it Q dot V. In fact, even sometimes in my writing, I try to, yeah. So you really shouldn't call it Q dot in the equations of motion because in the particular case of quaternion representations of, of joints, then the derivative, you don't want to think about the derivative of a quaternion, so more generally, V is not always Q dot, but in this class, for the purposes of keeping everything simple, Q, V is Q dot, okay? Um, that's, how, by the way, also how I got 73, an odd number of state variables for, uh, for Atlas. It's because there's a quaternion floating around in there, and so the, there's seven numbers that describe the quaternion, but the, the spatial velocity is only six numbers. Okay, so at any particular state, I can evaluate the equations of motion and get a numerical answer for what is M, what is C, what is tau G, what is B, and that's enough for me to write a feedback controller, okay? There's also this cool thing that we can do, which is that we can also do things symbolically. So if you wanna do more advanced optimization against the equations of motion, that is also available in the tools that we'll use for class, and we'll use that a, a bit, okay? But again, the more you, of these equations you write, the re, you realize it gets, there's a lot of code very fast, that, you know, the symbolic form of these equations gets big fast. Okay, so let's say now that we're gonna do the um, feedback cancellation idea for my double pendulum. What that's telling me is I, I have, you know, gravity gave me, and inertia gave me some basic equations of this pendulum that swings around like this. But what I say is if I have torque at the elbow and torque at the elbow and torque at the shoulder, and that means that my, my number of actuators matches my number of degrees of freedom, and in fact, B is just a constant. It's full row rank always. That means I can do whatever I want with that, that double pendulum, right? I can bend it to my will, right? Um, so for instance, I can take the double pendulum and say, you will act like, I guess it has to be no more than two degrees of freedom, but I can make, you, you will act like a single pendulum, right? Um, that's an easy enough thing to do. So the way I do it is I write a simple controller here where I evaluate the manipulator dynamics and I implement my double pendulum dynamics. But for Q double dot, desired, with a desired acceleration, I just write down the equations of a single pendulum inside. So I say, you will act like a single pendulum, right? And if I run that, then suddenly my double pendulum acts like a single pendulum. It doesn't want to do this. If I put this in initial state like that with no control, it'll start, because the masses are different, it'll start swinging out of phase, but I can replace that dynamics with my own dynamics, right? In fact, I can even, gravity is at my will, right? I can say, oh, I'm gonna actually replace it with an upside down pendulum, right? And that should work too. And that's, I'm just a, computing torques that take and erase effectively the dynamics of my original robot and write down some, uh, some new dynamics, okay? And that is, again, fine if you know F1 and F2, if you're far enough away from your actuator limits, and if you're willing to burn energy to do it, we do know how to do good control. And actually, for robot arms on factory floors, even moving fairly quickly, that has been the dominant approach to control that has taken us pretty far. Okay, but it doesn't make Atlas do a backflip. Okay, and you'll, you'll understand why. Okay, so there are more, any, any questions about that? Right, if you have the simplest check, if you don't have enough actuators, if you have less actuators than your number of degrees of freedom, 
then you're definitely underactuated. You could have as many actuators as your degree of freedom. You could have more actuators than your degrees of freedom. You could still be underactuated, right? Imagine I have two double pendula, and I found some strange way to put, to put four actuators on this pendulum, and I put no actuators on this pendulum, right? Uh, assuming there's no coupling through the table, that system is clearly underactuated. I can't make this pendulum do my will, right? But, so it's not only a counting game. If you have not enough actuators though, that's a trivial check to say that you're underactuated. Okay, a few more fun examples. Um, <clears throat> Vehicles are in most cases underactuated, okay? That plane would have a very hard time accelerating backwards, right? This is a particularly impressive maneuver that these things do when they land on an aircraft carrier, right? They come in, they go to a non-negligible angle of attack, they try to catch a guide wire and hit the brakes and it's, it's very, very impressive. Uh, large accelerations but that there are things that that plane simply cannot do. You cannot accelerate directly backwards, for instance, with, those, with that actuator configuration, okay? Birds, similarly, they do better, actually, surprisingly better, but they're also underactuated. So how do I know that? So, I mean, how many actuators does that bird have? A lot, right? And I don't actually really want to get into a counting game because there's, you know, there's muscles everywhere and that's where you do have multiple muscles on one joint of the bird, for sure, so that you can have my silly examples not so far from the truth, okay? So if you just do the counting game, I don't think you get to, you get to very far on understanding whether this system's underactuated. But if you ask, can I make this bird take arbitrary accelerations of all its variables, for instance, if I just say, can that bird cause arbitrary dynamics to happen at its center of mass? then you can already point to, there's something that that bird can't do, right? The bird certainly can eventually, this is the controllability, you can eventually make that bird gain altitude, but I don't think it can go straight up, right? If it's moving this way, it can't accelerate directly vertically. There's some combination of complicated flapping, periodic motion, whatever, maybe it has to turn circles, whatever, it'll eventually get there. It can get to many states, but it can't accelerate in arbitrary directions. That is not to say, however, underactuated systems are just harder to control, but they can do amazing things, right? Right, so even in these, the, the things that these birds do, the equivalent of landing on a carrier is the birds land on a perch, and that's amazing how they do that. It's partly amazing because they go into these very complicated flow regimes where they turn their wings up to a high angle of attack, which is effectively stalling, which is stalling their wings, it's even a dynamic stall where the, the dynamics get very complicated. If I were to try to write down F1 and F2, and actually we will later, the equations of motion get very complicated. But these birds can do amazing things. This is my favorite high-speed video of uh, an owl landing on a perch, which I think if you look carefully, there's some bait right there. Okay, the dynamics here are Again, if you wanted to write down the equation and claim you know F1 and F2, um, you know, power to you. But the, uh, if you watch, I know it's low resolution on a big screen or whatever, but watch the, the leading edge feathers. As it, you can, you'll be able to see the moment of stall. It's actually surprising it's not stalled already. But you'll see these feathers ruffle up. Maybe we just can't see them in this resolution. Right there, they're definitely up, okay? And these birds do crazy cool things, right? And in fact, the numbers don't, you know, the numbers don't lie. They can stop in the, in a dimensionless quantity. There's a real good shot of the, of the complicated aerodynamics. These birds stop far faster in a dimensionless quantity of sort of drag coefficient. They stop much, much faster, like an order of magnitude faster than an airplane. Our best airplanes can stop. The super short runway landings of a fighter jet cannot compete with the way a bird lands on a perch. Okay, we worked on it a bit in my lab. We've, we've worked on trying to understand what it takes to build a control system to make an airplane land on a perch. And uh, we got pretty far and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about that as the 
the right lecture comes up. So the fact that the system is underactuated, in fact, this particular, this was the extreme case where the plane has many degrees of freedom, but we gave it exactly one actuator, an elevator on the tail. We didn't even get, put a propeller. We just shot it out of a little slingshot at the beginning of the room and asked it to land on a perch like a bird. And we had to build a control system that used that one, that one control surface to try to land it on the perch. And you can, but it just takes a little bit more work, okay? And including building a wind tunnel just so we could take this one picture. <laughs> um, and it, it doesn't mean it's fragile, right? So, so Joe's final thesis um, result was he wanted to be able to throw it from any initial condition. This again, has only the one actuator on the, on the tail and basically he could throw it. And of course, there were initial conditions where he didn't put enough velocity in so it couldn't make it to the perch or there were some velocities that were just so severe that you, wouldn't, you couldn't slow down fast enough. But for a huge range of reasonable initial conditions, that plane basically always landed on a perch. It just took a more nonlinear control approach to control, right? And birds are just awesome all over. Uh, an albatross, in terms of efficiency, right? An albatross can fly across the entire ocean without, you know, basically on one, it, its cost of transport is about the same actually, if you just measure energy in versus mass times distance traveled, is about the same as a 747, okay? But it does this as a bird that's mostly gliding, doing dynamic soaring over the, over the ocean, right? <coughs> It, there's a question about whether they sleep, certainly never lands, and in fact, if you see an albatross landing, that's not their forte. Um, you know, there's, because uh, they do it very rarely. Uh, you know, there's birds that can, that can dive, you know, 200 some miles an hour, right? When that's cool, but bullets, we can make bullets go fast, or missiles or something, but, but the maneuvers that they do to like catch a sparrow or something out of this 250 mile an hour dive, that's super impressive, okay? Uh, this is a, I sort of through the years collected amazing animal videos, and I won't, I won't show you too many, but some of them are really, really good. So this is a hummingbird that is flying in a wind tunnel actually, um, that is sticking its nose in a feeder and regulating it perfectly, right? And it's just, you know, it just looks like you would expect to see a um, hummingbird out the window doing, right? It's like, what's amazing about that? Look at the airflow. It's actually backstroking at like seven or eight meters per second or something while it's doing that, right? So they're, they're actually blowing air that way and the video of it when the air is this way and that way or whatever, it's almost, uh, almost identical. I mean, I've got videos of bats that are turning in half a body length and just all kinds of cool stuff. But this is my favorite of all time. Okay, so. This is the, uh, the fish video, okay? So um, this is an experiment at Harvard, but it was actually done in collaboration with Mike Tranafilu, who's at MIT. Um, <clears throat> this is a rainbow trout. People thought something might be clever might be happening in rainbow trout because these are the fish that swim upstream at mating season and it seems like that's pretty tiring. And then when they look at them in the, in the streams, they tend to hang out in the relatively complicated flow behind rocks. And maybe there's something economical or intelligent or something that they're doing hanging out behind rocks. If you, if you know, um, if you take a, a fluid and you push it around a cylinder, you'll get a vortex street coming off the back. So there's relatively complicated fluid dynamics there. And they wanted to explore that in a water tunnel. So they took a rainbow trout, put it in a water tunnel. This is a view from above. This is with no rock. This is the nominal gait of a rainbow trout. Okay, so that's sort of the initial conditions. This is the, what the rainbow trout does. There's a rock now just off the screen there. It, kind of, it looks like this one, but um, there's a rock just off the screen. The water's going from this way in the same arrow. Uh, that arrow happens to be in the right direction. Um, and it, its gait looks very different, okay? So it's sort of suggestive that it's, it's kind of playing, they actually call it the von Karman gait. They're kind of, it's kind of swimming back and forth not, not quite as cool as my paper landing on the table, but, but it's pretty cool. Like it's doing very non-trivial things with the fluid dynamics. But this is the best video of all time. You don't want to leave before this. But um, okay, this fish is again behind a cylinder. I'm telling you, it's really good. Um, okay, there's actually a string in this one connecting the fish to the cylinder because this fish is dead. Sorry. Okay, and you don't want it to go back and get caught in the grates. Uh, that would be experimentally inconvenient. Uh, but what does a dead fish do if you put it behind a cylinder? 
Okay, so it's getting knocked around by the vortices. It's somehow back on the end of the string. That's not surprising. What just happened there, right? The dead fish just swam upstream. There was no string pulling it like that. The dead fish just swam upstream, right? So there's something very beautiful about the dynamics of a fish that has evolved that the passive dynamics, you know, the fish is dead. Uh, the passive dynamics of the fish know something about vortices and resonating and going upstream, right? Even with the brain turned off. And you could think about that as a bit like our, uh, our passive dynamic walkers in water, okay? And for me, that's a calling to say, if we're not building robots that are doing some of that, we haven't solved the problem yet. It's also true in manipulation, right? So um, vehicles, you know, airplanes, autonomous cars, they can be underactuated. Uh, uh, you know, fluid dynamics are underactuated. Manipulation is underactuated, right? If I think about what is the number of degrees of freedom in this robot, this is a fully actuated arm. This is a fully actuated arm. But if you want to control the degrees of freedom of that box, then you don't have enough actuators to do it perfectly, right? So how do you control the dynamics or kiss the dynamics of the box to do something useful even though you don't have enough control authority to just erase the dynamics and replace them with your own, okay? And there's cases in manipulation where if I obtain perfect force closure, for instance, if I do an enveloping grasp, then suddenly the system is well approximated as a fully actuated system and you don't have to think about this stuff. And that's why most of our robots now, they kind of go like this and they don't actually do things like this where they're making intermittent contact and doing more, sort of less trivial manipulation. So we'll talk a lot about that. And my God, there's like so many human videos of things that I just, um, how do we do that? And what's the state space of that? And is it changing? Did it just change my state variables? You know, so uh, this is, you know, we're working hard on this now, but there are plenty of things we don't know how to do yet, okay? Making sushi is high on my list. Okay, um, so let me tell you basically the plan for the course in the, the next few minutes. So I'll just do the whole semester. Um, <clears throat> the notes, the course notes, I, I wrote textbook, I think in quotes, <laughs> partly because it's, it's, it's not quite done, uh, but it's getting better every time. And it's, um, it's actually not quite text either. I realized that as I was, as I was putting my quotes on, because I, I believe in, um, I think books are gonna look different. So there, it's an HTML book, it's online. You can print it if you want, but you'll miss out on the videos and the animations and the, the ability to expand theorems that you don't care about if in your first pass, but maybe you care about on a second pass. I, I'm still totally working that out and I would appreciate your feedback, but I believe that books should be written differently and I'm working on it. Um, okay, so the course book, is organized in terms of system, 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 system. We're gonna talk about pendula, acrobats, quad rotors, walking robots, you know, vehicles like this. And then there's a second part, which is about algorithms, dynamic programming, linear optimal control, nonlinear optimal, going on and on, okay? But we're gonna take a different path through the class. I, th I think it'll be still easy to use the course notes, but, um, a little map I like to draw here, which I have now lost. All right, so we're actually gonna start with some very simple systems like the double pendulum we just did. Even a simple a single pendulum has something to teach us um, where we understand some of the concepts in nonlinear dynamics. understand maybe what it would be like to do control in this way I aspire to do control. Um, it will do dynamic programming type algorithms on this. Okay, and then we're gonna just build up in complexity. So there's, after that, there's loads of model underactuated systems. And I believe a lot in having the simplest instance of a problem that captures the key idea. Walking, the dynamic walking community has done that very well. They have simple models and the like. 
There are models like the cart pole system that you might have seen in linear control, balancing at the top. We'll do the full nonlinear treatment here. Um, quad rotors. I can't really draw a quad rotor, but I'll pretend it looks like that in the plane. Yeah, that's maybe a bi rotor. Um, so these are like the model under actuated systems. They're toy problems, but they teach us a lot. And from there, we're gonna, we can do some vehicle work, do UAVs and, and, uh, and maybe autonomous driving, depends how much Wilco influences us, us and this. Um, we're gonna do walking robots. There are some beautiful, simple models of walking robots that look like rimless wheels or compass gates that fall downhill, and, but we can still analyze the equations. They're simple enough, simpler than Atlas. We'll talk about manipulation and humanoid robots. I'm not gonna try to draw that one. Um, then we'll get harder and we'll make them stochastic and robust control. So I could take my walking robot and make it suddenly walk on rough terrain, for instance, where the terrain is drawn from some distribution. That turns out to be a nice toy problem for thinking about control and stochastic dynamics. Um, do a little bit of fluid dynamics. I guess I can draw a fish. Okay, fluid dynamics. Each of these will inspire a little bit more in terms of what we need to do for control. Um, vehicles will start thinking about obstacle avoidance and thinking about inevitable collisions and path planning. This we start thinking about limit cycles. How do you balance periodic systems? How do you deal with contact, making and breaking contact? This is somehow combining the complexity of those two in a higher dimensional system. Stochastic and robust control has its own challenges. Fluid dynamics have their own challenges. So I'm trying to only introduce the algorithms as we have a system, a canonical system that will inspire those challenges, okay? Um, <clears throat> Deep learning happens in here somewhere, although there was no deep learning in the backflip video, to be clear. Um, I'm gonna try to, you know, things are changing fast, but actually most of these approaches are, they have learning in them for sure. Less deep learning in this class than you might think. Um, but I'm gonna try to call it out when we see it and, uh, and, and talk through where the, you know, the implications. All right, so I'll just finish up with a couple logistics. Um, so I, there's gonna be a problem set released tomorrow, due in one week, it's all on the website. Uh, we're gonna ask you to sign up for Piazza, just so we can, that's our discussion board. And I'd ask you to read all of our grading policies and, and collaboration policies and, and schedule, they're all, the syllabus, they're all up on the website, so I'm officially asking you to read them there instead of having me print them out for everybody. Um, so that's all on there. And I think in particular, so I wanted to say a word about teaching philosophy. I did go through most of these, uh, these things I promised. I did do some background examples, our definitions, feedback canceling to show that it's equivalent to a second order system, right, a simple system. Our manipulator equations, we got that. This is my sketch of the plan for the course. The teaching philosophy, this is, um, a question, a statement, uh, a warning, I don't know. So um, I think a lot about teaching. I have been thinking a lot about teaching. Why do I love it? You know, why do I do it? Why do I, you know, um, how can I do it better? How can I communicate more to you and how can you, I can learn more from you? Um, I hope you'll indulge me with a few experiments over the course of the semester. Uh, the biggest one of all being that this collab idea, for instance, right now. So we're, we're trying to put all the software online and make it relatively easy to use. I think uh, there'll be a, f a few bumps or whatever, but I'm gonna ask you questions relatively often, just, just at the end of every problem, so I'll just say, hey, what do you think about X, right? And uh, I really do strongly appreciate your feedback, uh, your ideas, and your, maybe your patience if I do a bad one. <sighs> yeah, uh, good. So I think you're ready. If someone uh, 
comes up to you in the street now and asks you, what is the definition of underactuated? What are you taking this underactuated? What is that? So you have a couple options, right? You could do a backflip. <laughs> I think if you wanted to do an, uh, a derivation, I would choose the control affine form. I find that it's the most digestible if you wanted to take them to a chalkboard. Or you could just like bend over and untie and tie your shoelaces. <laughs> and if they're not impressed, you can send them to me. Uh, I'll see you on Thursday.